from being a foreigner into being a citizen. And we thank you now that we are your children. And so we come as your children to love you, to worship you, and to listen to you. So come, we pray, by your Spirit. In Jesus' name, let's worship the Lord. Amen. Let our praise be your welcome. Let our songs be a sign. We are here for you. We are here for you. Let your breath come from heaven. Fill our hearts with your life. We are here for you. We are here for you. To you our hearts. You, our hearts are open, nothing here is hidden, you are our one desire. You alone are holy, only you are worthy, God, let your fire fall down. Let us shout.
to join the song So long before our lives To raise our voice alone Heaven and earth alive We've seen your faithful hand Your mercy Upon the praises of a thousand generations, you are worthy, Lord of all. And unto you, the slain and risen King, we lift our voice with heaven, singing, Worthy, Lord of all. this life, all through this life we lead, and on to eternity, our endless praise we cry, Jesus be Be in front of the 
his body back and drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The ancient sea by heavy storm, the silence still. So praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing Your praise, O oh Lord, O oh Lord our God. On the at break of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again. O oh, trample death, where is your sting? The angels roll for Christ the King. And on the third, that on the third. At break of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again. Oh, trample death, where is your stake? The angels roll for Christ the for us and saved us from the grave and for sin that one day we will see you face to face in all your wonder and we give you praise and glory this morning for you alone are worthy of such praise such glory that all creation sings of your glory just keep coming Holy Spirit we love you we love your presence and we thank you that you are here and we honor you and we worship you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we love you and come and make your home in our hearts, we pray this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
Well, please be said, thank you, sir. Man, what a wonderful time of worship. We're so blessed to have um, people who just lead us into his presence. Thank you so much uh, for that. Well, um, welcome to the Samungos AGM. Uh, whether you're here in Bologna High School or watching online in St. Margaret's uh, Academy Livingston. Uh, and if you're a guest with us this morning, you're going to see a bit about what we've been up to over the last year in a moment. We've got our review of the year, our first one back since I'm excited about that, just to remind us of all the many things that we do throughout the year that we feel God's calling us to. Uh, we're so grateful for a year of ministry in both locations, both in Bologna and Livingston. And it's been a very full year as we've continued to live out the vision to be love and to press into our core values of word and spirit, worship and prayer, family and kingdom. And we've seen God move in remarkable ways as we've been obedient to his leading. All that we've done through the year can only happen through our wonderful staff and amazing volunteers, that's you, who serve faithfully in teams every week, many serving again this morning, and many of you sitting in the room who have served. I mean, it's huge what we do throughout the year. And we continue to have uh, the, the, the Vestry Annual uh, Report available, which uh, um, was emailed to members of the congregation earlier this week. Uh, this report gives a snapshot of many of the highlights through the year and is a very encouraging read. And if you haven't read it, I really encourage you to do so. And it will help you see the bigger picture of what we do throughout the year. The report is now available on the website and copies of the full accounts can be obtained from Wendy Brown or Catherine Burnett. In addition, you may recall that Catherine provided a full financial report on last year to the church on the 19th of November, and the video of that report is still available on the church website. Now, as we move into the formal side of the AGM, where as a church we, affirm, uh, we need to affirm a couple of things, and the first thing is the auditor. Um, so, after the retirement of our auditor last year, the vestry appointed Thompson Cooper as our interim auditor in June 2023. Thompson Cooper, uh, our local accounting and audit firm with expertise in charity and church accounts. They have recently completed their first audit of our accounts, and at the AGM we're inviting you to affirm their appointment as our auditor and to reappoint them for a 2024 audit. Uh, all this you'll be able to do by form, which you, and Wendy will explain that all to you. Now next, uh, I want to thank our two vestry members who come off uh, this year and have given three years of, I would say, hard service, of amazing service. So Lisa, uh, you have brought laughter and fun, wisdom and compassion to the vestry uh, over the three years of service, and we're very grateful for your commitment over this time. Uh, and Rick, we are greatly appreciative of your passion for Jesus and standing firm for the truth which shines through you. Thank you uh, to you both for the sacrifice you've made and for all that you have done over your time with Vestry. Uh, thank you. Now we come now to the appointments of proposed new vestry members and our first two are Julia Sloan and Derek Thompson. Here's a reminder of their respective grounds, backgrounds. Julia has been part of St. Mungo's for over 30 years. She leads the Evangelism and Outreach Prayer Cell and is a counsellor in the Wellness Centre. Julia works for our global professional services firm where she has held roles including UK Head of Communications and Engagement and Managing Consultant, working with the UK government and corporate clients. She's currently Associate Director, Partner, Partner Matters, which involves working with UK uh, board and senior partner team on everything from one-to-one -one coaching and team development to writing ethical strategies, succession planning and performance assessment. It's quite large. Uh, Julia is on the board of trustees for London Institute for Contemporary Christianity. And secondly, Derek Thompson. 
Uh, Derek and his wife Lara and their two daughters joined St. Mungo's in 2006. Six, Derek spent over 20 years in financial services before establishing a leadership consulting and coaching business in 2007. Combining this with working part-time for St. Mungo's as operations director between 2008 and 12, he returned to our staff team for, for full-time as the di executive director between 2015 and 2021. His charity trustee experience includes two periods as our vestry secretary and five years on Edinburgh Ledger's board. Now back running the consulting business along with Lara, Derek serves in the church and the tech and ministry teams. So Julia, unfortunately, isn't able to be with us this morning. So I caught up early with her. So let's watch the video. Well, good morning, Julia. It's lovely to see you. Um, Julia, can you tell us, how did you first come to St. Mungo's? Yes. So I first came to St. Mungo's through the youth work, actually, as a young teenager. So I've um, been in St. Mungo's for over 30 years and basically, yeah, I can't remember exactly how old, but I became a Christian age 14, so probably about a year before that, I started going to Pathfinders, which was the, the younger youth programme at that time. Um, initially through the Friday night social activities and then over time started coming on a Sunday morning as well. So, you, so you've been through quite a lot and what other things have you done within St Mungo's? Uh, well okay so I guess as most people that have been here for that length of time quite a few things so I did help with children's work for a while when I was younger um, I've done chair rota, I've done hosting um, I've helped with alpha um, in various different capacities cooking believe it or not those who know me as well as helping to lead it um, I've helped on the God at Work course which actually um, I did myself as well at one stage, so that was really good. Um, care van, care shelter, lots of things. And you also lead one of the prayer cells. Tell us a wee bit about that. I do. So I lead the Evangelism and Outreach Prayer Cell, um, which um, we've had varying numbers at different stages. We're quite a small group at the moment, but we pray really specifically for the outreach activities, whether they're evangelistic or more social action as well. Um, and specifically Alpha, obviously, and just that's coming up in the next few weeks, we're praying for, for that, so, yeah. And that, I mean, obviously, prayer cells are core to what we do, and um, have, have you been encouraged by taking time each week to pray for these specific things? Have you seen answers to prayer? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's such a good um, discipline, if you like. So even if you're not feeling 100% up for it, by the time you've met... Uh, and prayed together and listened to God and had the encouragement of so often having things that align and uh, focus our prayers. It's, it's definitely, it's, it's a really key part of my week, actually, on a Monday night. We meet every Monday night, so, yeah, very encouraging. And obviously you've been uh, a member of St. Mungo's for quite a while. So what are you excited about as we move forwards as a church? Yeah, so what I would always say about St. Mungo's, and I've said it for a long time, is that... I think you know, God's 10 steps more than that ahead of us. And then leadership are at least five steps ahead of us. So I always get really encouraged when there's something that I think, oh, that's a bit, mm. but God's always on it and he's got good things for us. And I think the picture that I had last year was sort of scattered pieces of a crockery pot and God just bringing us back together, particularly after COVID um, and resetting us and then being this whole vessel that God can pour his spirit into in a new and a fresh way to overflowing. So, I mean, that's a bit subjective, but I really do feel in my spirit that this is a, a new season, he's reset us, um, and there's some exciting things ahead for us. That's great. Well, it, it's very exciting to, to speak with you this morning, and uh, we hope you enjoy the ski trip. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, thanks, and I'd like to invite uh, Derek Thompson up now. I think this is working, Derek. So there you go. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, Derek, can you just, how did you find yourself coming to St. Mungo's? Yeah, okay. So anyone that knows anything about our marriage will understand <laughs> that uh, <laughs> Lara was the um, driver of that. I wouldn't say I came here kicking and screaming, but I sat very close to the door just in case I needed to get out. So it's a very unusual church environment for me to be in at a very difficult time in our lives. Um, we'd been struggling with our marriage for a while. We came here and this church was instrumental in saving our marriage. Um, the formidable skills of Pat Banfield and the love 
of people like John and Cara Wilkinson were, were at the heart of bringing us back to each other and to God. And so that was how it began. And uh, we're still here and still married. So those are two good things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll go again. And you're, 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 you're wearing some mongers, uh, purple yeah. this morning. Yeah. Desperate for the votes, Ollie. Yeah. Desperate for the votes. <laughs> well, you need them. So, um, no. I've also got a tattoo. All right. <laughs> well, let's not see that. All right. Um, uh, now, what are you excited about as we move forward as a church, Derek? Yeah, two things. Um, I tend to look at the whole world through the lens of character and talent. And I think we are blessed with an extraordinary group of people in this room at the 845 in Livingston at the 630. An extraordinary group of talent and committed people full of character for the kingdom. And I think um, this church has achieved great things with God, but I think greater things are still to come. So I'm really excited about that. I'm not into excitement generally, but... (laughs) If I was to say what's exciting me, it's that. I think there's amazing things that we can do. The second thing that I'm excited about is is you, if I can put it that way. I think you're doing an amazing job, Um, you and your team. We rehearsed that earlier to embarrass you. Um, And last year I spoke about how I think it's our responsibility to hold your hands up and just like they held up Moses' hands. Um, So I think I've probably got to put my money where my mouth is and support you. So I'm excited about the opportunity to serve and support you. Well, um, Derek, uh, I just want to honour you. I really appreciate Derek. It's been such an impact and uh, influence in my life since I've known you, ever since I first met you when we went to Bethel together. And I just want to honour you and thank you. And thanks for having the tattoo. That's great. (laughs) Thank you so much. Well, next we have the reappointment of of Brodie Petrie as the People's Warden, as your warden. Brodie will stand for re-election as People's Warden. And I want to take this opportunity to thank Brodie for her commitment to this role over the last year. And I'm very grateful for both Brodie as the People's Warden and to Eric, uh, who is my my warden, the Rector's Warden, for their support, their encouragement, and their prayers. Uh, We now move on to the the reappointment of our lay representatives, our diocesan kind of uh, uh, reps. Next, we have Francis Cummings, who will stand for re-election as the lay representative, and Alison Wilson, who will stand for re-election as the alt lay rep to the diocese. These two roles provide a link for the diocese, uh, for the vestry, and I want to thank you both for doing this this year and all that you both do on vestry. I also want to thank all the the vestry for their service over the last year. We are very blessed as a church, as Derek said, to have such uh, amazing people, such gifted people as our trustees who are faithful in prayer and committed to carrying out the work of the vestry each month. Um, I'm now going to ask Wendy uh, to, to come up and take you through um, the, the voting process. And I just want to honour Wendy as she comes up. Wendy is our, our vestry secretary, which is a pretty thankless task. Uh, it, she does an excellent job to keep us on track and keep uh, vestry flowing with sending out all the papers. And I just want to thank you and honour you, Wendy. Uh, and uh, I'm going to lead you to do the rest of it. Thank you very much. I'm not going to clear the decks for me. <laughs> okay. Talk, about, talk amongst yourselves. It's just a little bit short. I succeeded Derek as Vestry Secretary, and we have one thing in common. Well, we have many things in common. We're super organised, we're super tidy, uh, and I don't get excited either. <laughs> I do not have a tattoo. (laughs) 
This is the, the formal bit, so I'll have to add a bit of humour to it. So we now move to our point in the AGM where, where you have the opportunity to affirm the nominations that Ollie has just mentioned. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to complete the affirmation form, uh, which you would have found on your seat, hopefully, if you're in a, a location of the concourse here in Balerno where there isn't a form. There are some spare seats around the building, so uh, perhaps... Lynn, my trusted host, could keep an eye out and see if there's anyone needing a, a form to complete. We also have a QR code this morning, so the first time we're trialling this. Again, depending on where you're seated in the concourse, you may get a signal, you may not, hence why you have a paper form as well. So we're going to try uh, the QR code uh, this morning as well. And this will take you to a form which will go straight into church suite, and I'll pick up that information tomorrow morning. Uh, we are a large church, uh, we're spread across two sites, therefore it is likely that some of you are not going to personally know all the people that you're being asked to affirm this morning. Equally, nobody expects everyone in our church to be familiar with the skills and expertise required to be on vestry and serve as a charity trustee. Charity trustees are the people who share ultimate responsibility for governing a charity and directing how it is managed and run. This is why we follow the convention of having the existing vestry do the groundwork for you. We feel as the people actually doing the job month on month at the moment, they are ideally placed to know the following things. What skills and expertise is required? What kind of character and chemistry balance is required relative to those already on vestry at this time. And who in the congregation might have the relevant experience and character qualities for the season that we're currently in. And so you are of course all able to make up your own minds about these things. But if you're unsure about affirming someone you don't personally know, can I encourage you to place your trust in the prayerful due diligence which the vestry has completed on your behalf. So we're going to begin the process of uh, a slide of the affirmation form, which uh, you will have. So in a moment, I'm going to draw the AGM to a close. This is your cue to complete your affirmation form. But first, there are just a few things to, to highlight and make you aware of. Please only complete the form if you are 16 and over and a regular worshipper at St Mungo's. If you're completing the paper form, please put your name in the space provided. This simply allows us to confirm that you fulfill the criteria I've just mentioned, and to reassure you that the process is confidential, that it's only myself and Ollie that will see the forms. Once you've completed your paper affirmation form, please hang on to it until the end of the service, and there'll be buckets at the exit as you head out to my left, and there'll be a bucket at the information point for you to pop your, your form into. And in Livingston, there'll be a, a bucket by the information table in the atrium. If you're completing the form via the QR code, this affirmation form is exactly the same as the paper version uh, on your seats this morning. But please remember to add your name at the bottom uh, of that form on the QR code. Uh, that's a required field. Please respond to all the affirmation statements by putting a cross in either the yes box or the no box. And the final thing to say this morning is that we will, um, we will verify the votes on Monday morning and then we'll announce to the whole church uh, on Monday later in the day the results of this. So with all that uh, relayed to you, I'll draw our AGM to a formal conclusion and I'll ask you to complete your affirmation form. If you're having problems this morning with a QR code, do grab a, a paper form and I'm going to invite Alison and Eric to hand out some pens if you're using the paper forms this morning. Thank you. Needs a, a pen this morning. Are you okay? Okay. 
perhaps while you're doing this process, if you've completed it already, maybe turn to the person next to you. And Julia's on a skiing holiday t as of today, so if you were to go somewhere tomorrow, far, far away, where would it be? back to the reality of being in Blurna High School. Uh, thank you. Just want to thank Wendy for all the hard work that goes on behind the scenes. We really appreciate you, Wendy, and uh, uh, thank you. It, everything runs so smoothly at the ATM because of you, so thank you. Um, well, before I share uh, about the next step of our spiritual vision, I want to say that we are continuing to work on the possible building options for here in Bologna. As issues continue to arise for us here in the high school, and we will hopefully be able to share with you all the possible next steps early in the summer term. Please be praying that God will continue to lead us and guide us in this process. But I'm very grateful to all those who are helping at this moment. Now, I am very excited to share with you this morning and, and share the next stage, the next step of, of the vision that I, I feel the Lord is leading us to as, as a church, as some Mungos, both in Livingston and Bologna. The next stage is simply the last part uh, of the vision God has already given us. And I'm excited to share this because I know how key it has been in my development and growth as a disciple of Jesus. And it's summed up in two letters. Go. It's probably the hardest of the three words. Abide, transform, and go. Let's remind ourselves of the vision of St. Mungo's. St. Mungo's is a church family who look to be loved as we are loved. Together as we take up the call of Jesus to abide in his love, be transformed by the Holy Spirit, and go with the good news of the kingdom of God to be loved. So as we abide in his presence, we're transformed by his word and spirit, and we go with the good news of the kingdom of God to bring his kingdom to be loved. And as we live such a life, we live out the great commandment and the great commission that Jesus has called to us to as his disciples. Now, since sharing this vision, we've looked at what it means to love God with all our hearts, our minds, our soul, and our strength. As we abide and we love him in response to his love as his children in our true identity. We've looked to be transformed by the Holy Spirit as we live our lives open and obedient to him, living generous lives with what he has given us so that we can bless others, both who know Jesus and those who don't, to be growing disciples in that. And this morning, we look at this last word of go that I sense God is wanting us to push into as a church, that as we go with the good news of the kingdom of God, we make disciples. This is the great mission of the church that has never changed and yet is so often forgotten. And Jesus defined the mission of the church in Matthew 28. And I want to be really clear about this. This is what the mission of the church is. Go, Jesus says, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I love how often when Jesus commands us to do something, he gives us a promise too. 
And we'll see that as we look at what it means to be a disciple. I've sensed for a while now that God wants us to continue to be loved by abiding, by being transformed. And then as his disciples going to make other disciples in love. In one sense, this is nothing new. But it's probably the hardest part of the vision. And I think God's been preparing us over these last couple of years so that we're ready for this. I feel that God wants us to really push into this so that we become a discipling church. And I realize this is going to take some time. What encourages me is that discipleship is something that is already happening in St. Mungo's. Just to pick out a few things this morning. So in our older primary, for example, Caitlin and Ruth have started a discipleship group in the last year called Dive In, where they meet to read the Bible, pray, build friendships, eat and have fun together and learn what it means to be followers of Jesus. We're also seeing discipleship happening in our older youth in the S4 to S6 group, where they're growing in their relationship with God and with each other. A while back, we recently launched Safar, which is a discipleship tool within the company of men here in Bologna, which allows uh, us guys to get to know each other a bit more, to encourage each other to be disciples of Jesus, and to become more of disciples as we move forward. Safar is also a tool that we're going to... put out to the whole church, which we're going to encourage you to meet in one-to-one, whether with friends or with people you might not know within the church. And to, it will help you to become, um, go deeper in your relationship with Jesus and with one another. Me and Aid Smith have been doing it over the last six months, and we've loved it. It's helped us grow in our friendship, but it's also helped us, again, to hear the call of Jesus on our lives and to encourage each other. And there'll be more about that later on in the term. Now, one of the things that Jesus calls us to be as his disciples is fruitful. As we live this new life for him uh, that he won for us by his death and his resurrection. Jesus makes this clear when he stated, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. But what does it mean to be fruitful as a disciple of Jesus? Two authors, uh, Jim Putman and Bob Harrington, in their book Discipleship Shift, wrote this. The New Testament is intently Christ-centered. Jesus is the key to everything. He's the bread of life, the light of the world. The good shepherd, the vine, the gate, the way, the truth, and the life, and the model to follow. The ideal life is focused on Jesus. It's not just trusting him, but also truly following him. To focus on him is to live a fulfilling life. It's about becoming more and more like him in the power of the Holy Spirit to the glory of God. To be conformed into the likeness of Jesus is the goal. The word for this is discipleship. And the New Testament church was all about being and making disciples of Jesus. I love that thought at the end of that quote. That the New Testament church was all about being disciples. Of abiding in Christ and being transformed by Christ. And then also making disciples. Going. So to be fruitful... For Jesus means two things. Firstly, to be conformed into the likeness of Jesus. Paul, when writing to the church in Rome, said, For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son. So that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. I love that how that verse paints us of being a family. We were chosen to become like Jesus. The first part of being fruitful is to be conformed into the likeness of Jesus as his disciples, becoming more and more like Jesus as we follow him in the power of the Spirit and for the glory of God. 
So as we abide and as we, uh, we are transformed. And then the second part of what it means to be fruitful is that we, as we go into the world, we make disciples. Remember, Jesus chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. Fruit will, that will last. That's Jesus talking about you and me. That's Jesus talking about people. That's Jesus talking about us being witnesses and making disciples. So to be fruitful as a disciple of Jesus means to be conformed into the likeness of Jesus, to love God and others, fulfilling the great commandment by abiding and being transformed. But it also means as we go, we make disciples, which is the mission of the church, fulfilling the great commission. I really like how Dallas Willard describes this. He said, discipleship is the process of becoming who Jesus would be if he were you. Just think for that for a moment. Discipleship is the process of becoming who Jesus would be if he were you. See, that's the amazing thing about Jesus. He doesn't try to mold us to all be completely the same. No, he's created us fearfully and wonderfully to be different. With different giftings and abilities so we can bring the good news of the kingdom of God. In different places. And all this is done out of a response to his love for us. We love because he first loved us. Making disciples is being part of love. We go with the good news of the kingdom of God to be love. As Dave talked about last time, so many of you are so good about being love in different ways. And that so often brings up conversations. What's different about you? Why are you doing these things? And it provides us an opportunity to share the good news of the kingdom of God. You know, I was very blessed in my Christian life right at the beginning. In the week after I became a Christian, two guys, two Christians who I knew, um, said, would you like us to disciple you? Here they are, Matt and Ed, with a rather younger me. We met every day for the rest of the academic year and we shared our lives, good and bad. We read the Bible together, we prayed and we tried to be loved to each other. There were great days where we had great fun, but there were also some really tough times where we learned what it meant to be loved when it all went wrong, where we said or did the wrong thing. And Ed, who brought me to the Lord, this is Ed here, um, has been a constant friend and has has discipled me throughout the rest of our time over the 25 or 30 years I've been a Christian. I've learned so much from Ed and Matt. And I've learned from them what Jack Deere writes about discipleship. He says, discipleship is not about passing on some skills. That's a mentoring relationship. Discipleship is not an accountability relationship, uh, relationship. People stress accountability when they don't know how to relate. Discipleship is loving someone, enjoying a person with whom we have a special chemistry, and teaching them to love the things that Jesus loves. Discipling someone is not an obligation. It's a pleasure. As I was discipled, I felt loved and cared for even when I got it wrong, and I got it wrong a lot. I started to see the fruit in my life of becoming more like Jesus and being encouraged to go and make disciples by sharing the good news. That small group of two then morphed into a bigger group. This group, we were called the Accountables. We met every Sunday afternoon to share, to read scripture and to pray for each other. Each week we would spend time with one of the group looking to encourage each other or do something social. And this allowed us to continue to grow And to encourage each other to grow as a disciple. We learn so much from each other. We still do. The following year that group morphed into into another one. uh, As that year ended I went to America. To Washington State. And one of the things I was so excited about. Was that I got to disciple a group of high school seniors. Here are just some of them. They were an amazing group. That year, I learned about discipleship, about the importance of loving well by turning up to watch football games in the middle of the winter, taking them out for breakfast and answering their endless questions about relationships with grace, and taking them to the Ukraine on the mission. 
The next year I went to DC and discipled two guys who I'm glad to say are still bearing fruit. And one on the right was I was best man to. And then I moved to Wester Hills. Another opportunity to make disciples. Not all the young people and adults I've discipled are still following Jesus. But I love hearing from those who are. I love continuing to disciple other people. The key question for us as a leadership and a church is, are we making mature disciples of Jesus with those who are in the church family, who are not only able to withstand the culture we're in at the moment, but also make disciples of Jesus themselves? A disciple is not just a convert of Jesus, but a doer, a learner, a student, a Christian follower, an apprentice of Jesus, a lifelong follower and learner. A key thing for us as we move forward in this year is to have a clear understanding of what a disciple of Jesus is. So let me ask the question, what is a disciple of Jesus? How would you define it? Well, the good news is as we read through the gospel, Jesus actually defines what a disciple is. And it's very clear and it's very short, so you'll be able to remember it. But let's turn to Matthew 4.19. If you've got your Bibles, whether on your phone or in paper copy, I'd I'd encourage you just to open your Bibles to Matthew 4.19. Where Jesus defines what it is to be a disciple. Jesus said, remember he's speaking to two men who weren't his disciples at this moment. But he's inviting them to be in relationship with him. And he says, come follow me, Jesus said. And I will make you fishers of people. I think there are three marks of what it means to be a disciple that Jesus teaches us here. Firstly, is a disciple of Jesus follows Jesus. Come follow me. Secondly, is transformed by Jesus. And I will make you. And then goes for Jesus. I will make you fishers of people. So let's take each of these Firstly, a disciple of Jesus follows Jesus. Come, follow me. This has to do with our, with our heads, with our minds. Notice the first thing that Jesus says to Peter and Andrew. is, come, follow me. So a disciple of Jesus follows Jesus. Jesus leads and we follow That's what repentance means, that we were living our own lives, um, making our own decisions in a sense, just for ourselves. And then we have a revelation of who Jesus is as the Son of God. We repent and believe and we turn around. That's what repent means. And we start to follow Jesus. At its most, most basic sense, a disciple of Jesus is a follower of Jesus. He becomes our Savior and our friend. And Jesus makes it very clear what it means to love him as we follow him. Look at John 14. It says this. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the father who sent me. So the first thing about being a disciple of Jesus means to follow Jesus To repent and believe and follow Jesus. That means that in our heads, we and our emotions, we look to follow him. Not what we want, but what he wants. Next, there's a promise here. And I will make you. The promise is that Jesus will transform us as we follow him. Have you ever noticed that about this this statement that Jesus gives us a promise? That as we follow him, it's he who will transform us as we work in partner with him. He will make you. He will transform you. Jesus will transform us into his likeness, into being fishers of people. Jesus invites us to follow him before we all have it sorted out. You know, I remember one girl who... um, she gave her life to Jesus, and then she had a bit of a, uh, a kind of a, a moment. And I can remember her coming to me, and said, she said, she said, I've become a Satanist. I was like, what? I thought you were a, a follower of Jesus. 
I was like, oh my goodness, what do you do with this? You know, this is not what you want to tell your boss. That one of your youth who was a follower of Jesus has now become a Satanist. I was just like, oh. And boy, did I pray. I got on my knees like this. And I agreed that in a week I'd meet this girl to talk with her, um, with one of our female um, youth leaders. And I remember going to, to meet with her. And, um, and I was like, ooh. And, and she said, oh, it's all right, all. I've given up on that. I'm, I'm a follower of Jesus. I was like, okay. Uh, and she said, you know what? He loves me for who I am. I had to do all these ritual things to enter into this small club. It was so dark and horrible. But Jesus accepts me as I am. See, we don't have to have it all worked out. All we need to know is our need for Jesus and our willingness to follow him. And he will transform us by the power of his word and spirit. And then as we, as we follow him, he promises to transform us, to become in his likeness, but also so that we go and we make fishes of people. And I will make you fishes of people, Jesus says. This is about our hands and our feet. Jesus doesn't just die on the cross and rise again so that we can receive eternal life, so that we come to church. No, he, he gives us a, a new life and a purpose. And that purpose, that mission, is to make disciples. Peter and Andrew had been fishermen all their lives. They'd been growing up that way. And Jesus invites them into a relationship with him. He says, come, follow me. And I will, I will transform you as you follow me. And I will give you a new purpose, a new mission. And that is to make disciples. And the only reason that you and I are here is because they took up that mission. And as, uh, as Jesus went back up into heaven, they were empowered by the Spirit. And they went and they made disciples. And that's why we're here. That's the mission of the church that hasn't changed to go and to be, to make disciples. To be disciples, to be growing disciples, and to make disciples. So as we follow Jesus, he will transform us. He'll transform our brokenness, because we're all broken. That's why we need Jesus. And then as we go, as broken people, being transformed, being restored, being loved in our true identity, we go to make disciples. How did Jesus make disciples? Well, he invited them along. He didn't say, right, next Tuesday at 9 o'clock, you'll be in the classroom, and uh, I'm going to teach you uh, Discipleship 101. He didn't say that. He said, come follow me. Discipleship is best done through relationship. We see that as we continue in the New Testament with Paul and Timothy. Paul writes this, you, Timothy, have followed my, Paul's teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch and Ixium and Lystria, with which persecution I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you have learned it. You see, Paul basically said, follow me, Timothy. Be an imitator of me. Why? Because Paul was an imitator of Jesus. You see, discipleship is best done in the family. It's best done in relationship. That's why Alpha is so good, because it's done in relationship. We talk, we eat together, we invite our friends. As we start to think about making disciples, it's important for us to understand what our responsibility is. So I think there's three parts. Our responsibility the person with discipling's responsibility, and then God's part. Firstly, what are the things I can do, my part, to, to help um, develop a person? And that could be someone in the congregation, because I'm talking about, I'm talking about discipleship. I'm not just talking about people who don't know yet Jesus. We're, we're all discipling each other. We learn from each other, yeah? That's why we have house groups, so that we can learn from each other, that we can grow together. That happens best together in a family. And so our part is to be disciples, to follow Jesus, to spend time with him. And then as we, as we, 
we make disciples, our commitment is to pray for them, to be there, to be in relationship with, to be vulnerable, to listen, to, pr- to share with them. That's what it means. But we need to be a disciple. That's our part. So that they can see Jesus in us. And then what's their part? You know, we can't, we can't live the life of Jesus for them. They have to make that decision. They need to be committed And they're going to have their ups and downs as any new disciple does. You know, I remember um, this guy when I was in D.C. asked me um, if I would disciple him. I said, of course. Let's meet on Monday. We'll have breakfast together and we'll just start just to, to talk about what it means to live for Jesus. He didn't turn up. Next week, he said, oh, can we do it again, you know? So he met and, man, it was tough. And yet, he just, there was no desire on his part to be a disciple of Jesus. He wanted uh, Christianity to be what he said it was, not what Jesus said it was. And eventually, he had to give up. And then it's God's part. It's only God who saves. It's only God who transforms and sends people out with him to make disciples. We can do none of these things and we need to just be patient and trust him and pray. I can remember a guy, uh, I was discipling Worcester Hills and oh, it was going great and he was really growing in the Lord and then he got a new job and he got more money and his focus started to change and he started not to meet and he started to have his, his view on other things and I, I talked to him, he wasn't interested. So I prayed that God would encounter him and bring him back. And he had this encounter one night in his flat. And the next day he phoned me up and he said, oh, I'm really sorry. I want to start again. I said, well, every day is a new start with Jesus. So let's start. And I can say that that guy is now living for Jesus. So the next step in God's vision for us as a church, as Jesus' disciples, growing disciples, is that we go and make disciples, that we are a church where discipleship happens the whole time. Remember, we love because he first loved us. We do this out of his love. This means in our day-to-day lives, we need to be disciples of Jesus. We need to be followers of Jesus. You know, we need to repent when we get it wrong and continue to believe even in the tough times. We need to surrender our lives every day and follow Jesus. We need to be in the Gospels. We need to abide and spend time with Jesus and follow him. And here's a picture of what that looks like. If we just go to the next slide. We love because he first loved. So we need to be disciples. We need to follow Jesus with the core value of being loved. Then as we do this, as we follow Jesus, we become growing disciples, committed to be transformed by Jesus. As we follow a Bible, we're transformed into the likeness of Christ. As, as, you know, as we attend house group and do different things, we, we grow together. And we start to bear fruit, greater fruit in our lives. And this is all done in relationship and in love. And again, what does this look like? Well, as we are disciples, as we be disciples, we we are transformed by Jesus and we become growing disciples. You see how it comes? You're not going to grow unless you're following Jesus. But if you're following Jesus, you're going to grow. And then as growing disciples, we become making. We go and I will make you fishers of men. As you look for opportunities, you share the good news of, of, of the kingdom of God. Why? Because you're in love with Jesus and you want others to know of that love. Sometimes it's hard. You know, sometimes when you're out in the street, you don't feel like sharing Jesus. But yet someone asks you a question or you have that opportunity to share. We want to be a church that's fruitful, both as a family and as individuals. You know, what does this look like for us as a church? Well, being disciples, I've said it before, but I'm going to say it again. This means that we, re, church, we, we need to really sow into 
our relationship with Jesus. We need to spend time in his presence in prayer. Tell him how it is. Be honest. Be real with him. You know, so I think so many of us are frightened that if we say, God, I'm really struggling. I'm really struggling with this. You know, the only way that God is... And he already knows, but he wants you to say so that when you welcome in and when you ask him for help, you know it's him. You know it's him who's coming to help you. We need to be disciples, church. We need to spend time with Jesus. We need to be in the world, open to the Holy Spirit, and be obedient to him. Is it hard? Yes, it is. But actually, there's blessing that comes out of obedience. So the first thing we need to be, church, is to be disciples, to follow after Jesus. You really need to get this. And then as we follow Jesus, we grow. And I will make you. Maybe you've got, a bit, got stuck in a bit of a rut. And I'd really encourage you, when we launch so far throughout the church, that you go, oh, you've got a friend. You go, why don't we start so far? It's a one-to-one discipleship tool. And it's great. It's really easy. And it's not just scripture and like memorize. It's actually building relationship with God and with the person you're doing it with. Why don't you start to do so far when we launch it with one of the congregation? Are you attending house group? House group is our opportunity in a big church to be church, to be loved, to disciple each other, to love each other. I I love my house group. I wasn't feeling so well this week. And so I said to the house group, look, I'm really sorry. Um, Can we not meet this week? And then back came the texts praying for you. You hope, hope you get better soon. You're just being love. Using your spiritual gifts within the house group to be loved, to encourage others, using the prophetic, praying for people to be healed. And then, you know, we, we grow most when we're serving. Do you know that? When we're on mission, whether in one of the outreach, whether it's the farmer's market, whether it's minis, whether it's Spirit Cafe, whether it's Alpha, whether it's the caravan. Whether it's be love in the sense of valley friends. Whether it's being in the wellness center. We actually learn when we use our gifts. Are you using your gifts at the moment? Because when you do, you grow. Because you have to take that step of faith. Faith is about risk. Because we're not relying on ourselves, we're relying on God. So if we want to be growing disciples, we need to be disciples. We need to follow Jesus. And as we follow Jesus, we get transformed. And as we get transformed, we have this passion to do what Jesus wants us to do as a church, which is the mission that Jesus has given us, which is to go and to make disciples. That's how the church grows. And each of you have got people that only you know. Who you, who probably might even be hungry for Jesus. Now, I was thinking about what was going to be the giveaway. You know, someone asked me, is there going to be a gift this this year? And I was like, no. (laughs) I was racking my brains. Oh, God. You know, like this. I was talking to Dave. I was talking to Wendy. And um, one of the... One of the churches that when I was in West Ailes that we used to love working with was the Redeemer Church, the Nigerian Church. It was just wonderful. And that when we went out on an outreach in West Ailes, they used to wear these baseball jackets. And on the back it said, ask me about Jesus. I was like, oh, I want one of those. <laughs> ask me about Jesus. Yeah, has Jesus changed your life? Let me ask you again, has Jesus changed your life? Is Jesus changing your life? Could you do that on your own? No. See, we often forget we've got good news. We forget what Jesus has done for us. So we've all got stickers. (gasps) So I thought, well, I better do this first. So I stuck it on my mobile phone cover. Ask me about Jesus. And it was amazing. Stuck it on, and then I went into the co-op. And you could see the, the woman go. <laughs> and then on Friday, I was in a restaurant in town. Had it on the table. The waitress. <laughs> see, all, all the surveys that the church is doing at the moment is saying that there are thousands of people who want to know about Jesus, but they don't know who to ask. 
They don't know who to ask. Isn't that really sad? And they don't want to come to church because they don't know what church is like. They think it's boring. You know that Jesus has changed your life, don't you? Yeah? Can we get a bit of buy in here? <laughs> not trying to be corporate, don't worry. I'm just asking a fact. You know that Jesus is changing your life, yeah? You've got testimony. So when someone asks you, all right, what, what's Jesus done for you? And then you can say, well, actually, he answered a prayer this week. I've been going through a really difficult point, and he's brought peace in the midst of all that's going on. See, people want to know that God is real. People want to know that actually Jesus can make a difference, and they're really hungry. Is that scary? You know, when I stuck that on the phone, I was like, ooh. My first question came to mind, what are you going to say at all when someone asks you? I was rehearsing. It's good to rehearse. It's good to be prepared, isn't it? It's good to have fresh testimony each week. That's why we pray. That's why we encourage each other. You know, I thank you so much. You know, when Derek said, you know, um, about me, thank you for your love. Thank you for the way you encourage me. I really need it. You're a wonderful church family. I couldn't do life on its own. I just really couldn't. I've tried. It doesn't work. That's, there are people out there who are alone. I remember, final story, uh, when we were out in Livingston one day, we were doing free hugs. And I can remember Laurie Hudson telling me, we gave this hug to this guy. The person hadn't been hugged or touched for, for something like five years. Five years. There are people out there who don't know that they're loved. They don't know the good news, and you do. So we've got stickers for you. You can stick, I stuck another one on my Bible, because I often have my Bible out, I take my Bible to a cafe. Where are you going to stick it? Are you going to stick it on your coffee mug? You know, on your water bottle, on your phone cover? And just start praying. See, we need to be bold, church. And we've got good news, amen? And we can just be love in the midst of it. We don't have to go straight in for the jugular, tell people they're a sinner, they need to say, actually, we just need to tell them about Jesus. They'll work it out for themselves sometimes. You know, and this might put the fear of God in you. This is the hardest part of the vision. I think it's, you know, we love abiding in his presence, don't we, as a church? We love being in his presence. We love being transformed. But say the word go, and it's like, oh. But we're called to go. This is the mission of the church. And so I want to be a discipling church. I know lots of you already disciple people, and thank you so much for doing that. But I want to make this a real focus for us as a church. And that we disciple one another as a church family. We encourage each other. We use the gift things God has given us, but we also look to disciple others. How do we do that? We tell them about Jesus. Ask me about Jesus, and I'll tell you. And the good news is that we don't do it by ourselves. Remember, we work with God. We're in partners with him. One of the things that I find really encouraging is the last thing that Jesus said to the disciples. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes to you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We've been baptized because we believed. And God gives us, wants to give us fresh power so that we can be his witnesses, to bring the good news of the kingdom of God by being love. Amen? It's not I have to, it's I get to. And one day, when we're seeing him face to face, we might look to the left or the right, and we might have the privilege of being able to say, God used me to bring that person into the kingdom. There's no greater reward than to bring someone into the kingdom, to allow God to allow you. So let's be a church. 
um, who discipleship is at our core. Why? Because we love Jesus and we want others to know. So please, even if you don't stick it on your phone today or your water bottle, please take a sticker and pray. Or where do you want me to stick this so that people can see it and people can ask me? We're at 12 o'clock, so let's just pray. And if you, let's just pray in our seats. Um, I mean, I think some of you think I'm like, oh, evangelism crazy. I get scared. You know that moment when someone, you go, oh. But we've got the Holy Spirit to help us. So, Holy Spirit, would you fill us again with your fresh power so that we can be your witnesses? So that when someone asks us about Jesus, that we're able to share about what he, you've done in our lives, Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit, and fill us afresh. And thank you, this is a church that loves really well, looks to encourage, to grow each other as disciples. Help us to take the next step, to go and make disciples in your power so that many may come into your kingdom. And we may have the blessing of seeing people coming to know Jesus and following him. So come, Holy Spirit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, parents, if you need to go and get your kids, can you get them now? I'm going to ask the band to come up. And we're going to sing one last song. And uh, after this, our, there's two things I want you to do. If you haven't dropped your um, uh, uh, affirmation forms in, uh, voting forms, then please do find that yellow bucket and drop them in. And also, um, why don't you get a sticker? Why don't you get a sticker? They're going to be, you know, if you're going out now, come back and get a sticker. But let's be a church that's bold. Amen? That might have been 10%. We're going to keep hammering on with this. So let's stand and let's worship. Yeah, Father God, we just thank you that you don't just call us to follow you, but you call us with a new purpose to be your disciples and to make disciples. And in and this new phase for us as a church, would you empower us to do that? And may we be surprised by the way you work through us and are working through us already to grow disciples and make disciples. In Jesus' name, amen. the Lord and he reigns on high he is the Lord spoke into the darkness created the light he is the Lord who is like unto him never ending in days he is the Lord and he comes in power when we call
gospel, O oh Lord, is the hope for our nation. You are the Lord. It's the power of God for our salvation. You are the Lord. We ask not for riches, but look to the cross. Give us the loss, we pray, that your kingdom would advance through us. And now may the blessing of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. have a great week. Bless you. <laughs>